Dr. Lewis. Thank you very much for accepting my invitation for my this uh, interview. Uh, basically, oh, I want to ask the question, what is advertising in your perspective? What is advertising? Yes. Well, it's a very interesting question. Um, advertising is probably as old as art and certainly as old as writing. Some of the first advertisements ever seen appeared in ancient Greece in 5th century BC. In fact, one of the earliest advertisements which we have ever found was advertising for the return of a slave called Seth, who had run away from his master's uh, off workplace and today he was offering a gold coin for the return of this slave. Um, but in this advertisement, which he uh, 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 which, he, which he published, um, he also used it as an excuse to sell his wares. So the advert ran something like, uh, wanted uh, the return of Seth the manslave from the house of so-and-so the weaver, who makes the most brilliant cloths for discerning gentlemen. Um, so he was kind of selling his business while he was also trying to get his slave to run away. In, in, in ancient Greece, they used, also used to have um, people who would go around the streets singing so they sort of had jingos, almost like we do in commercial television today. Um, but the advertising really didn't take off in, the, in, in Britain until about the 16th century or so. Uh, it then became very popular, uh, actually open to a lot of criticism. The, one of the first articles uh, criticising advertising appeared in, around about in, in the uh, 16th, 1600s, uh, written by um, Dr Johnson. Um, and he said there was much too much advertisements now and it was very boring for people and he didn't really like the whole idea. But the interesting thing about advertising in the early days was its job, they saw the job as, not really as they do today, um, to persuade people to buy things. They simply saw it as presenting the information um, to the public. So if you were, a, I don't know, if you sold handsome cabs, for example, they would have an advertisement which would show a picture of the handsome cab and say, buy this handsome cab. And really none of this changed until the beginning of the, um, the, the 19th to 20th century, really. Uh, in around about 2000, 19, 1904, at the start of the 20th century, uh, a man came along who had been a, actually a Royal Canadian Mounted Policeman, a man called Kennedy. Um, and he got a job with an advertising agency and he said to them, look, I'll tell you what advertising is. Advertising is salesmanship in print. In other words, what the salesman would do, and a salesman, if he or she came to see you, would try and persuade you to buy something. They wouldn't just say, here's this Apple iPod. They would tell you all about how wonderful the Apple iPod was and how it would change your life. So from that point on, very interestingly, advertisers saw themselves not so much as in the presenting business, just giving information to the public, but in the persuasion industry. And they then, at this time, began to look to psychologists um, to help them make more persuasive adverts. And so the first group of psychologists, psychiatrists, who were used by advertising agencies were the Freudians. Mm -hmm. um, towards the uh, 50s, uh, the Freudian gave way to the behaviorists, the behavioral psychology, um, people like Skinner and Watson were the kind of fathers of behavior. Um, John Brohaus Watson was actually a, a uh, an academic psychologist. Uh, but he got fired from his university for having an extramarital affair. And the, the university, those who were very straight-laced, they, they sacked him. And he went straight into advertising. And he made an absolute fortune. He lived uh, the life of a, of, a, of, a, of a very rich chap because he had all this money from advertising. Uh, so this was the behavioural model. And this really existed up until about 15 years, 20 years ago. And at that point, the neuroscientists became involved. So we have this move from the Freudians with their emphasis on the subconscious, on castration complexes, on penis envy and all these kind of Freudian notions of what motivates people. And they were very successful. Um, they created a lot of uh, interesting advertisements. And then came the behaviorists um, who just look on the brain as a black box. You don't go inside the black box. You just look how people respond. Uh, stimulus response, that kind of thing. And then came along the neuroscientists. Uh, and at that point, uh, it's really where I enter the scene in a sense. And so um, what we're now looking at is advertising as a form of persuasion. And what advertisers are looking to do is to find ways of, in a sense, manipulating people, manipulating their behavior, influencing them, persuading them, trying to create 
uh, particularly in the last 30 years or so, an identity around the brand. Now, how did I become involved? Well, in the, in, the, in the early 80s, I was working at the University of Sussex in the Department of Experimental Psychology, psychology where I was working as a clinical psychologist, and I was lecturing in clinical psychology, which is about things like anxiety and depression, and also psychopathology, which is a study of mental illnesses. So we're looking at psychopathies there. We're looking at things like um, schizophrenia, for example, or uh, depressive, manic depressive illness, this kind of thing. And I was interested in what is called biofeedback, where you actually feed back to the individual things which are going on in their bodies. So, for example, if I wanted to find out how stressed somebody was, what I might do is to attach some sensors to their fingers, and this would measure their level of sympathetic arousal, which is a measure of, of anxiety. Um, and then we would maybe have a, a, a changing lights or a dial moving, a, a pointer moving across a dial or maybe have a sound. And as they change their behaviour from a very anxious state to a relaxed state, they would notice this on the machine. It would tell them they were relaxing. And I con constructed a number of devices to aid relaxation using my biofeedback. So, for example, I built a toy train uh, and you, you wired yourself up to the train and, and the train would move around the track faster or slower depending on how relaxed you were. So it was a kind of way of trying to help people visualise this. Uh, and then there came on the scene a device called a mind mirror, which was built by two um, British, uh, well, by a British electronics engineer called Jeff Blundell, who'd worked during the war on radar. And there was another man called Maxwell Cade. Maxwell Cade was a Buddhist. Uh, he was very deeply into meditation. He worked in hospitals training people in meditation, particularly on cancer wards. Uh, and he and Blundell got together and they built this device which was the earliest and most primitive form of EEG, which was not used in clinical practice. In clinical practice, uh, when I was working as a doctor, you would have a machine which you would attach people mm -hmm head to them and they would have a series of, of graph paper which would move uh, uh, and, uh, and there would be a lot of pen, pens moving and showing the different frequencies in the brain on, on graph paper. And then you'd look at the trace and you'd, uh, you'd if you were tra trained to read EEG patterns, mm -hmm. you'd be able to say, well, this person has got an, uh, is having an epileptic spike or this person shows evidence of a brain tumour. The mind mirror didn't do that. Mind mirror was designed entirely for meditation training, for relaxation training for training people to go into a, into a particular meditative state called an alpha state, which is where the brain is producing a, a frequency between 8 and 14 cycles per second, 8 and 14 hertz, which is subjectively experienced as a very relaxed but alert, a, a mindful state, but a very relaxed mental state. And the mind mirror work, it had a series of LEDs um, on two screens. One showed the right side of the brain, one showed the left side of the brain, and the LEDs the height of the LEDs above the baseline showed the increasing frequency. So at the top, you'd have high frequency beta waves, then you'd have alpha waves, and you'd have uh, theta waves, and you'd have delta waves. So the four main bands which this machine detected. And I was interested in training people to produce this particular mental state, um, which I call the alpha state. Uh, and the BBC produced a documentary about my work on, on the alpha state. And I wrote a book about the alpha state. Um, and then I, what I was looking for was some stimuli which I could show people in order to understand how the brain processed uh, data. And what I hit upon was the idea of television commercials. Because television commercials last 30 minutes, 30 seconds I should mm -hmm. say, they feel like they're lasting 30 <laughs> minutes sometimes. 30 seconds usually. Um, they're designed to be very uh, persuasive, they're designed to have colour and images and music and everything. So I wrote around a number of advertising agencies and said, could you send me some commercials which wouldn't have been seen by my, my, my subjects in the south coast of England, um, in the university area. Um, so they did that and in return I wrote up a report on the, about the commercial. Um, and this was probably about 1990, 92, 93 when this work was being done. Um, there was a vague amount of interest, some articles were written. Um, I remember one article said, uh, uh, very Orwellian, said Big Brother is arrived, you know, this kind of idea, we were stealing their ideas, stealing their brains. Um, but nobody was really interested, and so for the next 20 years really nothing happened. 
you know. So, so that work was being done in England by me. In America, there was a man called Herb Krugman who did a study of how people watch television, not commercials, just how watching television. And, but he used one subject, N equals one. So it's really not an experiment. He's just got one girl, I think he was a 21-year-old typist, and he just wired her up, and he looked at, she looked at television, and he looked at her brain patterns, and then he got her to read a magazine, and he looked at her brain patterns. And he made certain dis the judgments about what was happening inside her head on the back of that. And that was around about um, uh, 70s, early 70s. So he was really the first person to do this, because I didn't get working on it until the 80s. Um, so, so, but really nobody took up this, nobody was interested in this. And then about, uh, about... Is it like nobody knew about it? Well, I mean, it was published in some of the academic papers, but I don't think people in advertising actually read uh, academic <laughs> papers. I think <laughs> the only people who read academic papers are academics. Um, yeah, they thought, I mean, those are two contrasting, you know, subjects, like nobody want to, you know... Yeah, there's no integration. Uh, yeah, no integration. No, that's absolutely right. And I wasn't particularly, I mean, I was an academic, I was working in a, in a clinical arena, I wasn't particularly interested in, in, in I'm still not particularly interested in commercialising these ideas, um, but anyhow. And then about 2002 or so, I was approached by two other people um, who had a company which made, created music. And the kind of music they created are things called sonic signatures, have you come across those? Well, when you open up your laptop, if you're running a PC, you'll have a few notes of music, which is the signature tune mm. of Windows. Um, and these are sonic signatures, or if you watch the news on television, they'll have a, a piece of music which is trying to tell the view, this is, you're now you're watching. And we tested these sonic signatures um, to try and get the most perfect ones for them. And they got interested in this, and so they, they asked me if they'd, I'd like to join them in setting up a company which was called Neuroco, and that was the first UK. In fact, it was probably the first neuromarketing company in the world. When um, was that? Neuro, when? It was called Neuroco. Yeah, when was that? Probably around about 2000 or so. Right, so we're talking about Neuroco. Yes. Neuroco as a company. It was fairly successful. We did work for Ford Motor Company. We did work for 20th Century Fox. Um, we did work for um, a number of major multinational companies. Um, in fact, we were so successful that we were taken over by a company called Neurofocus, which was run by an Indian, set up by an Indian guy called Pradeep. Um, Pradeep was on a plane once when he met, was sitting next by chance to a neuroscientist who was talking about the work, the neuroscientist talked about the work he did, and Pradeep realised that he could use this in a commercial way. Um, and so really that's, and then he went to Nielsen's and he got a lot of money from Nielsen's to set up this business. Um, and he had great, he, he's great visionary, is Pradeep. Um, he's, not a, he's not a neuroscientist, he's, he's, he's got a PhD, but he's, you know, I think it's in electronics, I think he, in electronics or MIT or something like that. Uh, but he's got a great global vision, and he realised if he was going to make this company, he should make it a, as a big company, so it was a global company. So because they had a lot of money behind them, which we never did, he set up offices, uh, laboratories all over the world, in Beijing, in you know, Mumbai, uh, wherever, wherever there is possible co co companies who would be interested, <laughs> he set them up. Um, and he also set up a lot of laboratories for, people, for big major multinational companies and he would sort of charge them a million dollars and they would go in and set these things up. So it was a good money spinner. Um, Neurofocus has now been taken over by Nielsen, they bought them out. So it's now you know, owned entirely by Nielsen's. But they are no, undoubtedly the biggest company in the world. Um, they were was another company called M Sense, um, which which went bust, which went out of business. Um, there are a number of companies around the world who do this work. I suppose one of the best ones I think is a company in America called Sands Research. Um, the people who run Sands Research actually um, know they actually are neuroscientists. They've also did they also design EEGs, so they actually understand the technology. They're not kind of buying off the shelf technology and then trying to work out what it all means. Um, there's a number of business schools now which run courses in neuromarketing. There's a very good one in Copenhagen which runs a, a course which is way over, much oversubscribed. Um, and there are other courses in various parts of Europe. I don't know whether any American universities are, are, are operating that way. Um, so that really brings us up to the present day. A lot of companies are very interested in neuro, neuroimaging. Um, there are two ways, so, well there are a number of ways of imaging the brain non-invasively and by that I mean you don't have to inject things into people 
I mean, if you have something like um, uh, Prositon emission tomography, which is um, a way of, uh, you have to actually inject things into people's bodies. Well, you obviously can't do that. You can do that if, if, if you're studying their brain for medical purposes to see whether there's a problem with the brain, then it's medically okay. But you can't inject people with radioactive material, for example, just because you want them to watch a, a television commercial. At least it's not very good practice. Um, uh, so the two main ways of using it are fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, which is a, a technique where you look at changes to blood flow to different parts of the brain. And there's QEEG, and EEG is electroencephalography, and Q stands for quantified. So remember I told you earlier how uh, a hospital EEG will produce patterns on a moving sheet or on a computer screen now. Um, a QEEG uses various mathematical transformations, Fourier transforms, to look at the analog data and to, and to di digitize it. And having digitized, you can then present the data in a number of different ways, as graphs, for example, or as uh, create, create a sort of a, a, an image of the head and show different parts of the brain light, lighting up. And that's what they do with fMRI as well. They will actually produce a computer image of the brain. Uh, over an x-ray which, which shows changes in blood. So, so the idea is, supposing I give you a memory test. Now, if I give you a memory test, I would expect a part of the brain called the hippocampus, which is deep within the brain, to, um, to light up. And so I would look for that. And the, the, because when the hippocampus is working harder, you get more blood going to the hippocampus, because the hippocampus, if it's working hard, will need more oxygen, need more glucose and therefore the blood flow will be increased to that part of the brain. So it's like really looking at active areas of the brain, or more active areas of the brain. Um, QEG has the advantage, well it has a number of advantages. Um, first of all, you can use it in ambulatory situations so people can walk around. And we, we can measure EEG, for example, while people are shopping, walking around stores with the caps on their heads to read their electrical activity, uh, while they're applying planes, while they're um, well, virtually doing anything. I mean, I've, I've even recorded off policemen attending riots, riot training. Um, there are a, num a number of issues, a number of problems with doing that. So, uh, do you want me to go into a little bit of back the background of EEG, how that came about? Or is that no. You're, you're yeah, that's happy fine. with that. Yeah. All right, so EEG reads electrical activity in the brain. The brain is an organ which produces electrical activity. We read electrical activity. Um, but that means two things uh, in, in terms of problems. First of all, because the brain is what we call a volume conductor. If I have a sensor, let's say here, um, uh, above my temporal lobe, I may be reading from any area within about five centimetre of, of that sensor, because the, the current is not specific, the current is diffused throughout that part of the brain. So what QEEG can't tell you is exactly where the signal came from. And also it can't read, it's reading the surface of the, of the brain, the cortex of the brain. The cortex of the brain is a very thin layer, it's, five, it's about five millimetres thick. And that's what does your thinking for you. Um, so it's not reading the deep regions of the brain, uh, the limbic system of the brain, the basal regions of the brain, which is where emotions are generated, so it's not specifically reading those. Um, the thing about QEG is it's in real time. So if I'm wired you up while we're chatting and I see a peak of beta at a certain time frame, that is when your brain was producing that. Do you see what I mean? There's no, there's no time lag, there's no delay. I'm watching it in real time. I'm not sure where it's coming from, but I know what's coming is, is happening at that precise moment. Now, fMRI can't tell me exactly when it happened, like QEG, because it's a, it's a delayed, it's a delayed thing. They have to build up the image. But it can tell me precisely where it's happening. So you kind of, it swings around about us. With e, QEG, you know when it's happening, but you're not sure where it's happening. With fMRI, you know where it's happening, but you're not sure exactly when it happened. Which, you know, suggest that, well, wouldn't it be a great idea to put EEG and uh, fMRI together? And yes, and people are doing that now. But there are enormous problems with that because basically uh, an fMRI scanner has a huge magnet, uh, which is very disruptive to electrical signals. So you have to find a way of screening out 
or using algorithms to remove that noise in the system. But that is being done. The problem with QE, the problem with fMRI, in my view, from a neuromarketing point of view, yeah, are you okay? Yeah. Is that, look, have you ever had your brain scanned? You personally? Yeah. You've had your no, brain scanned? No. Okay. Well, it's a very unpleasant experience. Uh, it's getting less unpleasant because uh, the machines are improving, but basically you lie inside a thing like a coffin, a circular coffin, which is very claustrophobic. You mean they found a uh, machine? In a tube, yeah, you're lying inside that. a tube. Yes. Uh, and a lot of people, if you're claustrophobic, about 7% of the population are too claustrophobic ever to go inside one of these machines. You're lying flat on your back. Uh, you have to be absolutely still or you'll blur the picture. And so uh, here, here I am, I'm, I wanted to test my commercial. So I've got my subjects, they're lying flat on their backs in a very alien environment, which is very noisy. Yeah, somebody likened it to lying inside a dustbin and having t thugs kick the dustbin with metal tap <laughs> boots. So it's very noisy, it's very claustrophobic, um, and yet they're supposed to be looking at this television commercial as if they were at home watching this television commercial. Well, like, clearly, you know, it's not, it's a completely alien environment. So the question arises, how much really can you tell about how the person would respond if they were watching that television commercial in their own homes, in the comfort and security and peace of their own home? Well, I think that's an open question. Um, and also, of course, you, it's very expensive. I mean, uh, a good scanner will cost you a million, two million dollars. Uh, it needs a key team of highly paid, dedicated technicians to run it. It needs to operate in a specific facility, which is dedicated to that machine. So, in short, neuromarketing is a very costly business. It needn't be that costly. QEG is much less costly. A QEG, you could set up a. If you were to go and set up an, a scanning laboratory, you'd probably need to spend five or six million dollars, including the technicians and the building. You can set up a good QEG laboratory for perhaps, uh, at the outside, a hundred thousand um, dollars. So the equipment is, is light, it's portable. People can no, I think the equipments are getting cheaper, isn't it? <coughs> QEG, uh, fMRI. Some of these equipments used for the neuromarketing research. Oh, the fMRI. Not the fMRI, those other equipments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, then, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, that equipment is not expensive. Mm -hmm. I think our, the equipment we use, which is made by a Dutch company called Mind Media, um, it probably is about five or six thousand pounds. Yeah. The caps themselves, which don't last forever, they only last a number, they're probably about seven or eight hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, compared to what it would cost you to run an fMRI study, it's much, much cheaper. Yes. Um, and also it's much more flexible. <coughs> but the question is, um, well, I suppose there are two questions. First of all, how artifact-free is the data? How much noise is there in the signal? And that's a big problem. I mean, there are very good algorithms now, and we've written some of them ourselves, which can sort out the noise from the signal. But nonetheless, there are a number of sor sources of artifact. There are sources within the body. Um, the eyes are a dipole. The eyes will send a signal. Um, the, you're reading a, uh, a brain signal is in a millionth of a volt, and you're reading that through muscles, which are about a thousandth of a volt. So you're reading a very tiny current through a much bigger current. So um, if, you, if people frown, if their eyes move, that's going to put a, a, a signal. Uh, which yeah. you need to I remember. heard a criticism like, you know, to neuromarketing. What, what that guy said was like, you know, rather than neuromarketing, the, the, there is a, the, the science where they capture the facial expressions. The yeah, yeah, yeah. It is much more, you know, uh, they could capture the exact... Uh, Yes, feelings. Well, we've, we've, what do you think about we've, that? We've, we've got, we've developing software which will read emotions. Um, we, we read, uh, yeah, I mean facial emotion recognition is, 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 is developing very fast and a lot of people are looking at that. Um, uh, another thing which we actually developing a game, we're developing a program which will go online, so it means we can, we can use them all over the world from a central location. Um, have you come across IAT? Implicit association testing? Uh, well, that's a kind of a neuromarketing thing because we're looking at how the brain responds in terms of speed to different things. Um, and, and, and the great thing about that is, uh, because we put it, well, we haven't launched it yet, but when we put it online, we can run half a million subjects. 
You know, it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, go on. Um, in short, I mean, you have lots of experience in the neuromarketing research. How do you define what neuromarketing is? <coughs> Well, I suppose neuromarketing really is looking at the way in which specifically the brain responds um, to various stimuli, whether the stimuli is, is walking around the shop or watching a television commercial or looking at a poster or whatever you want to measure. And instead of asking people in focus groups, for example, or in surveys or the traditional metrics, me, me, metrics created for advertising agencies, um, the interest lever if you're watching a commercial come across that. Um, well, there are problems with that. People will tend to lie. They won't necessarily lie because they are liars, but they'll lie because they don't really know, because so much of the processing is subconscious. They don't have conscious access to their subconscious, and therefore they kind of invent answers. There are also all sorts of um, confounding variables. So, for example, there was one interesting study in America where they got people to complete words. So you might have a word like S blank Y. Um, and the only difference in the two groups was one was given out by uh, an Asian woman and the other was given out by a Caucasian male. Okay. Now what they found in both when they got the when the people and they didn't say anything, they didn't talk, uh, talk to me, they just handed them this form and said please fill in these complete these words. When they were handed to them by a, an Asian woman who was quite kind of demure and uh, and, uh, and non-dominant, um, they were tending to complete words like S blank Y as as shy. If it was given to them by a, 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 a white male, they tended to complete them as things like sky. Um, when the Asian woman was, they might complete the word as polite, and the other group would complete it as police. So they'd been subconsciously influenced simply by the their prejudices or their views, their attitudes about the person who's actually handed them the form. So there are a lot of subtle things going on in a focus group. Plus, people don't like to contradict other people. They like to have a consensus. If you're asking people about delicate areas, private areas of their lives, or things they might be embarrassed about, then they're more likely to lie. So you mean a, a marketing research answer? Marketing research. Uh, compared to neuromarketing has very less uh, That's what effective. the argument would be and I think there's a certain truth in that. I mean I think, I think, I think ideally um, researchers should cover all, all, all grounds. In the sense that we should ask people what they want, maybe we should measure their eye, we should eye tracking to measure where their eyes go when they're looking at a commercial. Um, we should ask some questions about it to get a subjective view about it. Um, we should maybe use um, other metrics. We should perhaps look at changes in skin conductance, which is a measure of physiological arousal, sympathetic arousal. Um, heart rate variability, maybe we would, sometimes we would do that. We might look at changes in breathing. Um, there are a lot of physio physiological parameters you can look at. And of course you can look at uh, EEG. And the idea there is the brain doesn't lie. So what the brain is saying is what the brain is saying. What the mouth is saying is not necessarily um, what the subconscious regions of the brain are saying. So I, I think it's a, it's a tool for penetrating below the surface of people's explanations. Um, I mean, if I say that, uh, you know, some of these uh, neuromarketing techniques can be used without those equipments, what do you think? Well, they can be. I mean, you, uh, and our IAT, Implicit Association Testing, doesn't need EEG. If that's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, there are other techniques which don't need. Um, we've developed systems in our laboratory where we can um, do eye tracking and, and, and get a measure of concentration um, just over the internet um, by, by measuring. Um, well, it's not exactly mouse tracking. There are a lot of companies who do mouse tracking, but we do something more sophisticated than that. So, yes, you don't necessarily need EEG. And the problem, another problem with EEG and with fMRI is that your sample size is going to be small. I mean, <clears throat> with fMRI, you probably would not have gone to run more than 20 subjects. Just the cost will become astronomical. With the QEEG, we probably run 30 or 40 subjects on it. Now, that's okay if the, if the group are fairly homogenous. So if I'm doing a, uh, 
if I'm doing look, looking at a commercial which is intended for uh, uh, a Singalese audience, for example, um, and I have 20 people, um, they should all be, say, 20 males or 20 females. They shouldn't be 10 males and 10 females, and then we're going to make a, you know, n equals 10 is, is probably not enough because everybody's brain is slightly different. So you mean, I mean, the ultimate results would depend on how 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 many people that you would uh, put into the. You research. need, I mean, in any study, you need to need you need a, n a number of people, but simply because of to you know try and find a central core because you're going to get a lot of variability in some subjects. Um, <clears throat> you see, another thing which will, will certainly skew an EEG, um, you have to have people who haven't, for example, had any caffeine, because that will change the state of the brain. Um, they mustn't be on any medication, they mustn't be on drugs, they mustn't be drug it, they mustn't have smoked a joint before they come into your laboratory, or the, you know. Um, they should all be right-handed, or they should all be left-handed, because um, handedness can skew the way the brain works. So you mean, I mean, the, the countries which has lots of money and resources, will they dominate the neuromarketing yes. in the future? Yes, I think so. I think, I mean, they will, they, they will, if you've got enough money to throw it, yes, you'll need quite a bit of money to throw it. In. But that doesn't mean that other countries can't adopt a lot of the techniques which are non... non you see, I mean, I think neuromarketing is a very useful tool. I mean, certainly in the medical arena, fMRI is an invaluable diagnostic and research tool for carrying out research into how the brain works. When it comes to saying, will I sell more, more of this Coca-Cola if I do this advertisement than that, I think it's much more open to question. I think an awful lot of pseudoscience goes into neuromarketing. I think an awful, awful lot of neuromarketing companies, well, some neuromarketing companies, don't really know what they're talking about. I mean, the um, American Research Foundation, Advertising Research Foundation, uh, the ARF, uh, last year conducted a study. They invited, have you seen this study? Well, you should look at it, it will be online. They invited all the major neuromarketing companies to take part in this study, which was going to be peer reviewed. Now, bear in mind, most EEG studies for neuromarketing are not peer reviewed. And that means, you know, as you know, presenting your data to people who are large people who know what they're talking about and getting them to evaluate it. So what they did, they got a number of companies. They got people like um, American Express and uh, uh, Campbell Soups to give commercials. They all gave these commercials to these, I think about 10 or 11 companies took part. MindLab took part. And the only companies which wouldn't take part were Neurofocus, and M-Sense, well now M-Sense is gone. Uh, Pradeep said, no, I don't, we, we create our own metrics, uh, we know what we're doing, we don't want to subject it to outside scrutiny. And indeed, one of, the, one of the kind of problems a lot of academics would say about neurofocus is they will not reveal how they analyze their data. They just say, trust us, uh, you, you know. Well, yes. You mean, uh, have they become more secretive? Yes. Well, you know, you can understand it. I mean, they, they want to keep their commercial coffee. If they've developed algorithms, which are their own uh, patented algorithms, they don't want people to steal them. But on the other hand, people who come from a more scientific background ex expect to publish their data so that other scientists can say, well, look, there's a major problem here. Well, this doesn't work. Why? So, <clears throat> so what uh, ARF were trying to do was this. They, they got a number of companies to produce reports on these advertisements. Right. Are well, there... I'm sorry, can I just finish that? Yeah. Yeah, because the, the thing was, you got, let's say, 12 companies took part, and 12 companies gave 12 completely different answers. Okay? So, maybe some of them were completely wrong, maybe some of them were right. Who knows? But the, the point is, there was no, there was very little consistency. So what is somebody who's in charge of marketing for, let's say, Campbell Soups to do? Well, this company says this about my commercial, this company says this about my commercial. Everybody's talking and nobody's singing from the same hymn sheet. So, you know, it, it that raises questions about whether the science behind it is valid or how valid is it and which companies are you actually using valid interpretations. And they will all claim that their metrics are right, that their analysis is right. Um, but, you know, they can't all be right. If the, from the output side, if the advertisements had been, uh, you know, excellent, hmm. 
I mean, um, whatever the, their techniques they have adapted might be different, but still the the outcome is what well, is you'd important. Expect, you'd expect people to say this. You know, if you're analysing a commercial frame by frame, you'd expect if 12 companies are all using the same kind of approach or, or having, you know, they would say, well, there's more interest here and more emotional engagement here than here. But if one company is saying there's more emotional engagement here and another company is saying no, the emotional engagement, what are you to make of it? You know, I think the thing is, it's very early days. I, I sometimes liken it to not quite the early days of flying, not quite Orville and Wilbur Wright in their sort of bamboo aircraft, um, but, not, but, but, but quite early primitive days. And, you know, and that's fine. It's a, it's a new science. It's only been going about a decade or so. It's obviously going to improve. Methods will be more refined. Methods of analysis will be more refined. But the problem with a lot of people who are basically marketing people who don't really understand the science and maybe haven't got scientists on board will then sell it you know like you're selling a Wright Brothers aircraft but you're saying well there's a first class cabin and you know we're going to show movies on the flight and you're going to have champagne and that's just not possible at that stage so I just think it's been overhyped and in fact that is a criticism a lot of academics have made I mean neuro, um, nature neuroscience had a um, called brain scam, not brain scan, brain scam, mm. saying, is it all hype? Is it all imagination? Is it... And there, there are, there's a huge debate going on in the academic world about what is actually proper science and what is pseudoscience. And a lot of people would accuse some marketing companies of, of really selling snake oil to people who don't know better. Are there any instances in the history uh, that the present day neuromarketing techniques were used consciously or unconsciously? Which, what type of marketing techniques? Of, I mean, uh, for an example, those post persuasive techniques. Uh, it's not basically the, the use in the, you know, the, the, the equipment as such. But for an example, the persuasive aspects of, uh, you know, um, of modern day neuromarketing. Have they been used in earlier instances, for an example, where um, when Hitler used some of oh, his speeches okay, well, uh, and his propaganda films? What do you think? No, they just did that on experience. That's what advertising was all about. It was about experience. Oh, uh, I mean, if, we, if we're talking about the early days of, 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 say, propaganda, Hitler, Stalin and the kind of stuff, Hitler was a master, or Goebbels, Joseph Goebbels, his propaganda ministers, were, were masters of the art. I mean, they were brilliant in an appalling way, but if you look at something like Lenny Reichenstahl's film Triumph of the Will, <coughs> which is a beautiful, brilliant, horrible piece of propaganda, but it's brilliantly, brilliantly done, um, and everything about the Nazi era was designed to enslave the masses, in fact, to, you know, to create automata, and it, it worked extremely well. Um, but certainly, I mean, if you look at some of the early uh, scientific research, not, nothing to do with neuromarketing, if we say, look at, let's look at the Freudians, how the Freudians contributed, a man called Dichter, um, who was one of the early sort of motivational gurus, um, he was approached by a cigar manufacturer who told him that he'd had this very expensive piece of advertising, poster advertising done, which showed a woman a rather glamorous woman handing out cigars to her husband and his friends. Uh, and they spent a lot of money on this piece of um, art. Uh, and it had actually bombed. The cigar 